Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we interview Kumar Sundaram, India's nuclear Gandhi, as he concludes a successful two-week trip to Japan to warn the country about a planned nuclear pact between their two countries and why that's not a good idea. Among Kumar's many activities, he spoke with the media, networked with activists, addressed the weekly protest in front of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's home, and went into the Fukushima exclusion zone. He provides a chilling first-hand account of what it's like within six miles of the still-deadly Fukushima Daiichi meltdown. Also this week, we talked with Beverly Kerr, Associate Director of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, or BREEDL, and she offers her observations on last week's Numbnuts of the Week regarding southern accents in the nuclear industry. Incredible insights you will not want to miss. Those interviews, plus Numbnuts of the Week, will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, August 12, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Focusing on Japan to begin with, with this chilling story from Fukushima Voice. On July 16, Toshihide Tsuda, a physician and epidemiologist at Okayama University, stated that in certain Fukushima municipalities, there was clear evidence of a thyroid cancer epidemic. He spoke at an expert meeting regarding the status of health management of residents following the Tokyo Electric Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident that was held by the Ministry of the Environment. Tsuda called this increase in thyroid cancer cases an outbreak occurring only 3.1 to 3.2 years after the accident, and that the outbreak of thyroid cancers in Fukushima children cannot be explained by the screening effect when the data is analyzed and compared with the national cancer statistics. Tsuda has been openly critical of the commonly accepted notion that health effects do not occur below 100 millisieverts and he presented numerous published studies that supported his case. So what was the official response to his presentation? Chairman Shigenobu Nagataki, Emeritus Professor at Nagasaki University and former chairman of Radiation Effects Research Foundation, hint, hint, pro-nuclear and funded by the nuclear industry, as well as a mentor to the infamous Shunichi Yamashita, otherwise known as the Dr. Mengele of Japan, Nagataki addressed committee members and told them, please do not hesitate to ask questions. Given what was just stated, it will be disastrous for this committee to have to conclude that there is an actual increase in thyroid cancer due to the Fukushima accident. Yes, it would be disastrous to the pro-nuclear perspective to be forced to conclude that there's more thyroid cancer because of Fukushima when the numbers and all the statistics are pointing in that direction. But your wishes and directives have absolutely no bearing on the science and the truth of the situation. Tsuda was not without his supporters at this meeting. Professor Shinzo Kimura who conducted field investigations in Chernobyl, reported that currently there are many cases of thyroid cancer, more than 250 kilometers, or 155 miles, away from Chernobyl. Matsumoto City Mayor Shugenoya, who has provided medical care to children with thyroid cancer in Belarus, said, even in areas contaminated with so-called low-level radiation, with an annual radiation level below 1 millisievert, Residents showed depressed immune function, hematopoietic stem cell disorders, and perinatal abnormalities. But medical personnel are not allowed to refer to the Chernobyl accident. Sounds a lot like what they're doing in Japan. Tsuda continued to sound the alarm. It's only been 3.1 to 3.2 years, but there are so many cases observed in Fukushima. We need to take immediate countermeasures. 
they are still being exposed to radiation. We can't wait until the results come out. All of us, as well as Fukushima residents, are being exposed to radiation. So with radiation continuing and children coming down with thyroid cancer in record numbers, what is the Iwake City Board of Education doing? They have decided to use local rice, locally grown rice, in school lunches starting this December. The kids are already exposed to radiation. What's a little bit more? This item is from Fukushima Diary by Iori Mochizuki, and we will have more details as they become available. Radiation continues to be the big invisible elephant in the living room of not only Japan, but the entire world. On Saturday, August 9th, NHK, Japan's public broadcasting company, announced that pieces of nuclear fuel from Fukushima were blasted at least 130 kilometers, about 81 miles, away from the Fukushima nuclear plant. Because of the ball shape of the fragment that was found, it proves that this was molten in high temperature and quickly cooled down, made of the same material as nuclear fuel and the structure inside the vessels. The particles were collected between March 14 and 15, 2011 in Tsukuba City, Ibaraki Prefecture, by a study group from the Science University of Tokyo. Every nuclear reactor and every nuclear accident has its own signature of radionuclides and elements. And this one showed, in addition to radioactive cesium, zirconium material of the fuel rods and uranium, and iron of the material of the pressure vessel. All of these materials match the structure of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor and the nuclear fuel that had already been detected. There is no question about it. Nuclear fuel from Fukushima was found only 15 miles from Tokyo's suburbs. Everybody still eager to book your tickets for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics? This one particle was found to contain 200 trillion becquerels per kilogram of cesium. Tokyo Electric Power Company's, or TEPCO's, actions regarding the radioactive water at Fukushima Daiichi continue to resemble nothing so much as the sorcerer's apprentice as they attempt to get rid of the water with buckets and brooms and no place to place it. According to Informable.com and our friend Lucas Hickson, TAPCO has determined that it will stop using Arriva's decontamination system, which uses chemicals to remove radioactive materials from water, as this system has not lived up to expectations since it was installed. What is the magnitude of their failure to live up to expectations? Here I quote from the article. The decontamination system was set up in June 2011, three months after the onset of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. The design was so complicated that it took 50 welders more than a month to put it together. In the first three months, the system processed only 76,000 tons of contaminated water and was repeatedly forced to be shut down by a variety of problems. For the last three years, the system has been unused and kept out of operation. And now, with this white elephant being completely discredited as a technology to be used, it must be dismantled and disposed of. And it has become contaminated itself after processing radioactive materials, so it just becomes more of the waste of Fukushima Daiichi. So much for that water purification scheme. So how about the popsicle fence that's turned more into a slushy or a slurpy or shaved ice at its best? TEPCO spent a lot of money to put this ice fence in place so that the water would not leak out through the ground in Fukushima Daiichi and there would be some control over the leakage. Well, that didn't work either. It never did achieve a hard freeze, despite the fact that TEPCO has been putting ice and dry ice into the underground trench to try to get it to stop leaking. Then on Monday, August 11, TEPCO admitted that the dry ice they had used, one ton of it to date, 
had clogged the drain pipes accidentally on August 7th, and so they stopped putting in any additional dry ice. What they have done is continued to put tons of ice, 222 tons of ice into the ocean, but that's not freezing either. No surprise there, because fresh water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but salt water freezes at 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is no way in hell, let alone Fukushima, that ice, regular ice, will freeze salt water. Hard to believe that everybody at TEPCO cut the exact same science class. So what's an incompetent Japanese power company to do? On August 7th, TEPCO told us they unveiled a plan to dump what they called scrubbed water directly into the ocean, sparking concerns over whether it would be properly decontaminated. Hint, I sincerely doubt that it will be. I mean, Arriva didn't work. Ice fence didn't work. Why should this work? Now, TEPCO has admitted that it's running out of space to store the contaminated water, and it's also fighting to contain contaminated groundwater under the plant from seeping into the ocean. So its current Rube Goldberg harebrain scheme calls for them to start pumping out the groundwater, purifying it, though we don't know how, and then releasing it into the Pacific Ocean, where it may flow free and swim with the fishes. Experts estimate that between 200 and 400 tons of contaminated groundwater are leaking into the ocean each day. And TEPCO admits that contaminated water is spilling directly into the ocean. But they want to decontaminate it. They just don't have a clue how to figure this out, and they won't even admit it and open themselves up to international input by some of the people we would trust, like Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education. This groundwater going into the Pacific includes high levels of tritium and cesium. In more corporate double talk, one TEPCO official assured the reporters that we would never consider dumping the water into the ocean unless we received the consent of local residents. Uh, excuse me. But haven't the local residents all been evacuated and moved away and not been allowed to return? So while TEPCO drowns in radioactive water with nothing they can do about it, the Japanese government is trying to figure out what to do, what to do about all that radioactive rubble and waste and that kind of stuff. Well, the government has offered to double the amount of grants to be paid to local municipalities in Fukushima Prefecture if they accept the construction of temporary storage facilities for radioactive debris produced by the 2011 nuclear accident. Temporary. The half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. How temporary is it going to be? But Japan's ministers of the environment and reconstruction have decided to offer Fukushima area governors and mayors an offer they can't refuse. They had offered grants worth $1.5 billion, so they doubled it. $3 billion is now on the table. Earlier negotiations became bitter and triggered a public uproar after the environmental minister implied that local residents could be easily bought. Minister Ishihara said on June 16, in the end, it will come down to money. That stalled the negotiations But since doubling the amount of money, the negotiations are moving forward again. So it does appear that it all comes down to money. The government plans to store all debris for 30 years in what they term intermediate storage facilities that are planned to be constructed in Okuma and Futuba in Fukushima Prefecture. So much sadness and darkness there, it's time for some genuine levity. Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is now on Facebook. In welcoming people to their official Facebook page, they wrote, 
We are excited about using this tool to enhance our interactions with you. Like us and check back often. We have some interesting things planned for this space. Not half so interesting as certain activists have planned for that space. They say, we want to hear from you. And at least once a month, we'll host an open forum and we welcome your input. Why does this feel like an invitation to shoot fish in a barrel? Now, they make it clear that this is not part of any formal NRC process. That has to be done through channels, and that's done very soberly and very somberly. But, man, can't we take some pot shots at these guys? I don't care if they write, We reserve the right to remove comments that are inappropriate and do not meet our guidelines. Yeah, but... Sarcasm, criticism, cartoons, funny statements, contradictions. There are all kinds of things we can do there. If nothing else, give yourself a break from all of the hardcore negative stuff that happens on Facebook regarding nuclear and go there and make fun of the guys to their face. They say that they look forward to hearing from us. Let's find out if they do. And that's why the NRC's Facebook page is this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of week. Regular listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat may recall that last week's Numnuts of the Week spotlighted the Oak Ridge National, meaning nuclear, laboratory in Tennessee and its recently scuttled plan to offer its staff southern accent reduction classes at $805 a pop, our tax dollars at work. After that item appeared, I decided to check with an expert within our community for her opinion on the crucial yet canceled government program regarding Southern accents. Beverly Kerr is Associate Director of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, or BREEDL, and she joined us today from her home in North Carolina. Beverly, could you please tell us your understanding of how important losing a southern accent is to those people who work within the nuclear industry. Well, Livy, thank you kindly for asking me to speak my mind about accents in the workplace. You know, if I could say something directly to these folks, I'd sure have to say that southern accents are most likely a low priority for most of us when it comes to nuclear concerns. Folks tell me I have a pleasant and calming voice. I surely hope all y'all don't mind my southern accent. Instead of being concerned about this, we need to concentrate on where we're going to put our nuclear waste and how we're going to transport it and all the serious issues involved. Personally, Libby, I don't want to fly off the handle about these piddling word warts, bless their hearts, I reckon they just need to quit being ugly and acting too big for their britches. They need to just get the nukes out of here and make the world a better place. Southern accents don't have much to do with it, do they? Libby, I'm much obliged to you for giving me the chance to say that these folks are just barking up the wrong tree. That was Beverly Kerr, Associate Director of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, or BREEDL. You can learn more about the organization at Breedle.org. In England, EDF Energy says it has shut down four of its UK reactors after discovering a fault in a boiler spine in Unit 1 of its Haitian 1 nuclear power plant. Although routine inspections of other boiler spines have not previously indicated similar defects, according to EDF, Routine inspections of this boiler spine had not previously indicated this defect. Maybe they need to change their test. Also in England, some of the world's top PR companies have for the first time publicly ruled out working with climate change deniers, marking a fundamental shift in the multi-billion dollar industry that has grown up around the issue of global warming. Now, if we could only get PR agencies to do the same for nukes. In Ukraine, the second half of the Chernobyl arch has been raised to enclose the decaying first sarcophagus, which was built to lock in the remains of the Chernobyl explosion in 1986. The first sarcophagus directly held in place 200 tons of radioactive corium, 
30 tons of highly contaminated dust and 16 tons of uranium and plutonium. This new sarcophagus, also referred to as a shelter object, is expected to last for 100 years, at which point another sarcophagus will have to be built on top of that. And when that one decays, what on top of that? How Russian. So in the future, when aliens land and start going through the many nested layers of sarcophagi, when they get to the center, boy, are they ever going to get a surprise. In South Korea, authorities plan to return contaminated steel scraps imported from Japan after detecting cesium-137 over allowable levels in it earlier this month. According to Korean authorities, there was no way of determining the areas in Japan where the scrap originated. South Korean officials will ask the Japanese government to assist and cooperate in sharing information in order to prevent any additional occurrences of radioactive materials being unknowingly transferred between the two countries. And kudos to a greenroad.blogspot for their exhaustive compilation of information on radiation found in cars and car parts exported from Japan. Truly Wikipedic in its extent and reach. We will have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode number 164. But a few snippets, radioactive cars have shown up and been turned back from Jamaica, Chile, Australia, Rotterdam, and Russia. Meanwhile, the European Union raises safe levels of radiation on imported cars by 300%, and the United States is doing zip, zero, nada, nothing. Huge implications for anything manufactured in Japan. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, it's too late for Christmas in July, but hey, it's only August, and you've still got five-plus months until we hit the holidays. So why not start your year-end gift-giving early with a donation to Nuclear Hot Seat? We do rely on your support in order to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. So if you haven't donated in a while, or ever, help us now. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the red Donate button. It's the gift that keeps on giving all year long. I caught up with Kumar Sundaram in Tokyo as he was getting ready to leave the country after a successful two-week tour. Kumar is a research consultant with the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace and founded the Facebook site Dianukes, which reports on the Indian anti-nuclear movement. I often refer to him as the nuclear Gandhi, and he's a dedicated firebrand when it comes to this issue. We spoke last Sunday, August 10, and just a heads up that early in the interview, he very quickly refers to the NPT and the CTBT, which he later explains stands for the Nonproliferation Treaty and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Just thought I'd give you a chance to understand it first time around. Kumar Sundaram, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. I I am really glad to be back on your show, and I think I have some very interesting updates to share with you. And the show has always been really great, so I'm I'm really glad. Thank you. You've recently been on a speaking tour in Japan, and I'm actually speaking to you in Tokyo right now. What was the purpose of the trip, and why did you take it at this time? This trip has been really interesting. I came here for the last two weeks and I came here in August because this month and the Indian Prime Minister would be visiting Tokyo to finalize the India-Japan nuclear agreement and I thought it would be uh, important to reach out to people here to let them know why we in India have been so strongly opposed to this agreement and to uh, understand the protest here to reach out to the activist people so in these couple of weeks, I went to several places in Japan. I, I also attended the peace commemoration in Hiroshima on August 6th. So I could reach out to a lot of peace activists, anti-nuclear activists, and it has been a wonderful experience. Explain to the listeners the nature 
of the current deal as proposed between India and Japan and how close it is to being implemented? The mainstream media and the official circles, they expect that the deal will be culminated during this visit of the Indian Prime Minister. Um, one of the reasons is that this is a new administration in India led by a party called BJP and they have a strong majority in the parliament. This is a supposedly a strong Prime Minister and the official circles expect this Prime Minister to culminate this agreement. Very briefly, this agreement has consequences which are slightly more than bilateral. India-Japan agreement is actually necessary for the U.S. and French nuclear projects to take off in India because the American projects, one by GE in Mithiwirdi, where GE is constructing four reactors, and second by Westinghouse in Kovara on the eastern coast of India, where, again, Westinghouse is constructing four reactors, and a big project by Areva in Maharashtra, Jaitapur, where Areva is constructing six reactors, six European pressurized reactor designs, and this is going to be the world's biggest reactors, world's biggest reactor park. These three projects are stuck in India because technically India requires to have a bilateral agreement with Japan, essentially because very crucial components which are manufactured by Japanese companies are going to be used in these three projects. And until India has an agreement with Japan, the French and American projects that I just mentioned will not take off on the ground in India. So these countries have been pushing Japan to have an agreement with India. So this agreement has wider consequences than a bilateral agreement. And it would help the French and the American nuclear corporates whose profits have been dwindling after Fukushima to get a foothold in new market in India and essentially to rehabilitate them post-Fukushima. How aware of this deal were the people in Japan before you came here? And what has been their response since you have brought this to their awareness? In the Japanese protests, I participated in Tokyo Friday protests last week. This has been amazing protests because ever since Fukushima, people every week have been coming in front of the Prime Minister's residence, in front of the National Diet, and they have been protesting every Friday. There has been, I was amazed to see the energy, uh, the diversity of the protests. There were all kinds of people with music, with their slogans, with their posters, people of all ages. So this protest has been really amazing. In the recent weeks, the focus of the protest has been to reverse and to resist the government's attempt to restart these reactors. As of today, all the reactors in Japan are closed down as per the requirement of the new uh, regulator and the government and the nuclear lobby have been trying hard to restart them. So when I came here, the focus seemed to be on the restart. Before coming here, I had written to all these groups that the Japanese anti-nuclear movement also uh, strongly needs to put the agenda of nuclear exports on its plate because after Fukushima, when TEPCO and other companies have not been able to restart their reactors, here uh, they want to essentially compensate for it by exporting reactors. So the Japanese companies now have massive export plans Japan is going to have an agreement very soon with a number of countries, including Jordan, Vietnam, India, of course, and other Asian countries. This must be stopped because essentially this is a plan, this is a survival plan of the Japanese corporates whose profits are on a constant decline after Fukushima. And uh, I was glad that all these groups uh, welcomed this idea. When Friday protests happened this week, very strongly they demanded no to restart of the reactors and a strong no on uh, nuclear exports as well. Realistically speaking, what is it going to take to stop this deal from going through in Japan? Is it even a possibility? I'm still hopeful. When I came here, I met a couple of MPs, members of parliament, and also officials in the Ministry of External Affairs. They have a particular uh, division of the ministry which is uh, dedicated to uh, nuclear cooperation. I spoke to those officials and I conveyed uh, the reservations of the Indian civil society before them. I am still hopeful because 
the agreement between india and japan has much deeper and wider consequences and even the people in the foreign ministry seem to be aware of them but here my own assessment very personal assessment is about how far the japanese prime minister would go personally because it seems to be his personal obsession with nuclear energy and his personal special interest in having militarist relationship with india otherwise if you look at it the japanese administrations have been consistently against this agreement even before fukushima because japan has a long standing policy of not allowing nuclear supply to countries which have not signed npt and ctbt and india is one of those very few countries which are still outside the npt and india has conducted nuclear tests so even before fukushima even before the whole question of desirability of nuclear energy per se came into discussion japanese administrations for over last several decades have been opposed strongly to any agreement any nuclear supply agreement with india because india has violated and has actually been in contempt of the international opinion on nuclear disarmament it's a country which conducted nuclear test it has a country which has not signed ctbt and npt and japan has a long standing policy of respecting those treaties so even before fukushima just on the count of nuclear disarmament the japanese system which has been sensitive after hiroshima has always resisted having a nuclear supply agreement with india so my own sense is there there are differences even within the bureaucracy even within the, within the ministry but of course the prime minister's own personal political will might be able to overturn this so i am personally still hopeful I asked Kumar for a brief history of the Indian nuclear involvement and also its relationship to the non-proliferation treaty and the comprehensive test ban treaty. The Indian government conducted nuclear tests in 1974 firstly and then again it conducted nuclear tests in 1998 uh, it conducted nuclear tests in 1974 by using the nuclear material that it got in 1950s and 60s under the rubric of peaceful use so it essentially cheated and uh, diverted that material and manufactured that those nuclear weapons what happened was after the 1974 agreement there was a ban on india against supplying any nuclear technology to india by the entire international community including us japan and other countries and this ban lasted for more than 35 years because india diverted peaceful nuclear so called peaceful nuclear material and technology for making nuclear bomb what has changed in recent years is because the us france and other countries have an interest in the civilian nuclear reactor market in india they have lifted that ban japan has still been reluctant because japan has experienced hiroshima and india has conducted nuclear tests it has not signed the non proliferation treaty the npt nuclear non proliferation treaty and ctbt which is comprehensive test ban treaty so even before fukushima and even if you leave aside the nuclear energy question just on the question of nuclear weapons nuclear disarmament japanese policy so far has been strongly uh, one of denial of nuclear supplies to india because india has conducted nuclear tests so that has been one part of very strong opposition to any nuclear supply agreement to india and japanese system has been built like that for last more than four decades so that is a resistance within the system and i am still hopeful that the officials the ministry and the differences here in the political system will prevent japan from having a agreement with india essentially i want to convey that this deal is bad for both reasons a because it is rewarding a country like india which diverted material and still being rewarded is even after doing tests so it's a bad precedent for nuclear weapons and disarmament 
So that's one stream of arguments against the deal. The other stream of arguments against the deal is that India is indulging in a massive expansion of nuclear energy. It's pushing and imposing these reactors on its people violently and the other anti-nuclear arguments. And, and so, so the anti-nuclear energy arguments and disarmament arguments, there are two sets of arguments against this deal. There's another thing I wish to cover with you. You actually were able to get very close to Fukushima Daiichi, even though it is technically not allowed. How did you manage to get close, and how close did you get? It's not allowed for general civilians, but obviously in recent few months, journalists have been allowed to go in. Some other people also have been allowed to go in. So with a journalist friend of mine in Fukushima, I was able to go into these ghost towns. I was able to see Itate Mura. I was able to see Futaba. And in both these towns, the entire population has been evacuated. And in all the last three and a half years, these towns have really, really turned into pathetic, horrible ghost towns. There I could see three feet, four feet wide grass growing in all these houses that I passed by. The Itate Mura station was just there, the railway station, the main railway station, and no train has come there in the last three years. So this was an entirely disturbing experience. In front of the railway station, there was a newspaper office in which in the window, the transparent window, one could see the newspaper of 12th March 2011 lying there which could not be distributed because the entire town has had to be hurriedly evacuated and several other things like that. There would be schools where everything was lying just like that. The children have were hurriedly evacuated. So all those pictures that I had seen about uh, the scene from Chernobyl started haunting me and it's a similar situation in Fukushima. And people from these towns who have been uh, rehabilitated elsewhere will never be able to come back. So essentially this whole area is going to be like that for several hundred years now. One doesn't know till when. Secondly, I was also able to meet the entire community which was rehabilitated from Ita Temura to a newer place called Date Higashi. And I had a longer discussion with the community leader there, Hasegawa San. He explained the whole trauma of being evacuated and still after three years not being able to find a proper way of life, proper life for the entire community. So these people who had their families, these people who had their big houses are now living in one bedroom sets. These families were joint families and 10 members would be living together, but now they are separated. This has led to immense psychological and social rupture in the Japanese society, which is unprecedented. So I could see that even in much more disciplined, much more advanced society like Japan, I'm comparing it with India, uh, even after three and a half years, the life of these people who were evacuated from Fukushima has not become normal. These people have still to measure the radiation in their food and only then they are, they can eat that. There have been small volunteer uh, radiation, food radiation measurement center where old women would bring their fruits which they grew in their own uh, kitchen garden or the backyard. And it was really disturbing to see those old women and old men to desperately trying to see if their fruits are okay and they could eat it because it's their trees, they have grown it and so on. And it was mostly old people because young people have all left that area and have gone to faraway places. Some old people are still living there because they might be thinking, okay, we have already spent our lives. So anyway, only a few years are left and so on. So these were mostly old people in Date Igashi. The uh, community leader, Mr. Hasegawa San, I had a detailed discussion with him and he explained the process. He explained the entire trauma. Itate Mura is a village which was not too close to Fukushima. Actually, it was one of the places which was further 
art and it was farther than Futaba Machi and other places. But what happened is the entire decision to evacuate was not well coordinated and the government left it to the town labor administration to decide when and how to evacuate. Now, the mayor of this particular town in Itatemura, he took several days and the evacuation uh, was delayed by a week. Now, what happened in result was, even despite the fact that this Itate Mura place was farther from Fukushima, people here got more radiation dose because they stayed in that radiation zone for more days. So people here uh, received more radiation than Futaba Machi. So even in Japan, which is far more better organized than India, which where we have seen that the administration is generally much more better in India. It's a huge country with big, big population. The administrative system is almost non-existent. So in case of an accident, I shudder to think if this is the situation in Japan after three and a half years, we definitely, definitely not need Japanese nuclear technology and uh, in fact in nuclear reactors from anywhere. We don't need the nuclear expansion that the government in India is planning because in case of an accident, we just don't have the civic administration, the entire preparation to deal with the consequences. In our area, the population is much more dense. The geography, the political system, the administrative system will not allow uh, swift evacuation and rehabilitation, which has not been possible in Japan even after three and a half years. So that was the feeling that I got in Fukushima. Here's a personal question for you. I saw pictures of you that seem to be taken in proximity to Fukushima within the 10-kilometer area. Is that correct? Yes. And in these pictures, Kumar, you are not wearing a mask. You are not wearing protective clothing of any sort. What the hell were you thinking? Um, the journalist friend told if we are going there just for a couple of hours, it's okay to go. And we had the radiation dosimeter with us. So we had this in mind that whenever, wherever the radiation dose is high, we'll definitely not go there. Uh, and actually this journalist had been going there regularly. So he knew the hotspots. He knew where it's uh, relatively safer. So we kept that in mind. In some places, we had the dosimeter with us and it was just going berserk. At one place, it was five point something. In some places, it was really, really high. But since this journalist friend knew these places, knew the hotspots, so we kind of avoided high radiation places. In that area, it's slightly uneven. So my own guess is that I didn't go to really dangerous zone, uh, so it was okay. And here's what I would like to come back with. As we know from Dr. Caldecott, all it takes is inhaling one one millionth of a gram of plutonium, and you're going to give yourself a lung cancer. There are so many other ways that the contamination can happen because there could be a hot spot next to a not-so-hot spot. And you are not the only activist, high-level activist, who I have seen and known have gone to Japan and have blithely gone around without any kind of protection. So this is not just for you, but it's for Mm. all of them and it's for anybody who's going there. Would you please, at minimum, at all times, wear a mask? Would you do detoxification protocols? Would you take zeolite? specifically liquid zeolite, if you can get it, to be able to detoxify your body. And Kumar, I'm saying this to you right now. When you get back, put in place every detoxification protocol that you can find. I will send you some that I am familiar with so that you institute this because, Kumar, we need you for the long run. We need all of our top activists for the long run. And if you have exposed yourself in this way, and not taken the protections that you might have taken beforehand, at least on the other side of this, do everything in your power to remove whatever might have gotten onto or into your body. I personally would discard all the clothing, Mm -hmm. and I've been told Mm -hmm. also it's a good idea to discard the shoes because there's more on the ground, because 
You don't need that in your life, and we need you. You are too important for us to lose for anything related to radiation. I'll keep that in mind. I do think that I went there and with this friend, I thought, okay, I, uh, we should go and visit these places. But I know it's uh, not safe at all. So I'll uh, I'll keep your advice in mind and I'll do likewise. I will send you some detoxification protocols that sure. I know about. Okay? Sure, sure. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? In closing, I would like to say that we have tried to reach out to many activists here and when the Indian Prime Minister was visit Tokyo this month and friends here said that they will stage strong protest and also we in India would have protest in front of the Japanese embassy in New Delhi. So people of India and Japan, they want good relationship with the, these two countries. So our protest is not against Japan-India bilateral relationship. We want better relationship. We want people-to-people relationship. We don't our, want our relationships to be held hostage by nuclear corporates, by the military industry. I have no doubt but that you will have made and continue to make an impact on not only India but Japan because of your efforts over there on this trip. Thank you so much. I hope to keep working and build solidarities. We'll build our strength and we'll move on and we'll strive for a better and safer future for our people. That was Kumar Sundaram in Tokyo on his way back to India to continue the fight. I'll be posting a link to Dianukes, the Facebook group, on our website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog. It's a great way to get in touch with Kumar. Hey, if you haven't read an ebook lately, have I got a read for you. Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is my ebook on what it means to find oneself only one mile away from a nuclear reactor meltdown while it is happening. Lots of fun, lots of yucks, and don't you dare get emotional. (laughs) I dare you to not. Anyway, it is available, as I said, as an ebook on Amazon Kindle. They do have free downloadable software for that, so you can play it on any digital device you've got. You can buy a copy of this right now for about the same as the cost of a cup of Starbucks, or if you want to have the bargain trip, wait until September when I will be offering it at a really low special price in honor of a landmark birthday. Either way, it's a great read filled with unexpected twists, turns, thrills, chills, and horrors. Not all of them nuclear. And you'll be helping to support the work of this show when you purchase it. Again, Yes, I Glow in the Dark. You can find it on Amazon as a Kindle. Activist shout-out. The Mama Bears Against Nukes are looking to find someone in Ohio or northern Kentucky who might want to do a monthly vigil outside the uranium enrichment plant at Piketon, Ohio. If you know that someone, or are that someone, get in touch with Mama Bears Against Nukes by messaging them on their Facebook page. John Stewart, I'm coming for you, booby. You know, the door is still open for John Stewart and The Daily Show through the bit he's been doing about buying CNN through a Kickstarter campaign and searching for new programming. What could be newer than honest, funny programming about nukes? I think Nuclear Hot Seat would be a good fit, don't you? So if you want to support my more than one year and counting campaign, to include regular anti-nuke information on the John Stewart Daily Show, here's how you can do it. Go to Twitter.com. If you have an account, sign in. If you don't have an account, get an account and sign in. You must be signed into your Twitter account for this to work. Then go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the blog page. Look for this episode, number 164. I will have a tweet in all of its splendor visible at the top of the website. Underneath the actual wording of the tweet, you will see three icons. One of them is a set of arrows chasing each other around a square, which stands for retweet. Another is a star, which means favorite. So click on retweet and click on favorite. That's it. If you really want to help and 
want to try this out some more, just scroll down to the tweet from last week's show, number 163, and click on both retweet and favorite for that one as well. The more people who do this, the greater the visibility of Nuclear Hot Seat to the one place in mainstream media that's actually equipped to be able to handle this information, and the better chance we'll finally have to get nuclear awareness on The Daily Show. My thanks to you for your help with this project. Here's today's final thought. I've been challenged lately to use Nuclear Hot Seat to support some of the more dire YouTube videos being produced on the damage being done to the world by Fukushima's radiation. I can appreciate that some people feel passionately about this material and that the various videos online may contain valid information. However, my editorial position on this show is that I tend to err on the side of being conservative in the information I pass along. I may get sarcastic. May get sarcastic? Moi? But I try to root the stories I share in multiple sources, or solo sources I have come to trust in over three years of producing Nuclear Hot Seat. There are often waves of incendiary, apocalyptic information being put out about, for example, the Unit 4 spent fuel pools at Fukushima, or the death of the Pacific Ocean, or mutant corn in a backyard Chicago garden. I try to resist what could be true, but also might be fueled by hysteria, or just plain pessimism, or maybe just bad journalism. I would rather be late with a story than wrong about it. And some of my rush to reporting in the first year of this show continues to haunt me. I hate having to offer retractions and apologies. I will if I have to. If I've made a mistake, I will fess up to it. But I've learned to measure twice, cut once. Consider the information. See if I can back it up. But Don't jump at it unless I feel secure that what's being shared can objectively be considered the truth, or a blatant lie worthy of my sarcasm. I am not going to be declaring the end of the world anytime soon. I may at times think that we've achieved the radiational equivalent of the last scene in the first Planet of the Apes movie, and I'm not saying there haven't been some dark nights of the soul when I've thought that we really have done it. But I have lived the hysteria and the fears close up and personal after Three Mile Island. At that time, I jumped off the nuclear deep end in my heart and soul. It was more than 30 years ago, and I only barely survived. So pardon me if I tiptoe among the expressed terrors and dire predictions and pick the targets that I can manage. Unless I have a direct source I trust... I will never be the first with a terrifying story or prediction. What I will do is continue to attempt to create context, continuity, a record of the history of our movement as it unfolds week by week. I'll track the emotional evolution of our awareness, bring in the human element wherever I can, and I'll also work hard to give support to our movement with awareness shared information, humor and internet links, and always, always attempt to keep us in good heart. Of course, whenever possible, I will kick nuclear wherever and whenever I can, as hard as I can, to do the greatest harm to their greed, hubris, short-sightedness, and sociopathology. As for the rest, I'll go walk my puppy. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 12, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Fukushima Voice, fukushimadiary.com, and our friend Iori Machizuki, NHK, the American Chemical Society Publication Analytical Chemistry, informable.com, and our esteemed journalistic colleague Lucas Hickson, AFP, Asahi Shimbun, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Reuters, TheGuardian.com, News1130.com, AGreenRoad.blogspot.com, TEPCO, World Nuclear News, 
and the ever-vigilant, ever-aware, and totally fabulous Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. I invite you to join us, friend us, and also tweet to John Stewart about us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts or on our searchable website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Please use the email Facebook tends to get lost. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for -for not-for-profit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse granted as long as proper attribution is provided, meaning my name and the website. If you are a for-profit member of the media, hey, let's have a conversation. We're going out this week on music from the not-yet-hit Broadway show, Armageddon, music by Grady, lyrics by me. With the USS Reagan sailors going to court against TEPCO next Tuesday in San Diego, which is where I will be, I thought it would be a good time for us to visualize what it is that we want. That's why I see, that's why there's me, that's my part. Listen, Dad, cause you gotta know. Write something clear from your heart My inner voice whispers believe and you'll grow Because you see, it's how you see This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat.
It's the bomb. <laughs> Huh? <laughs>